Well, hello, everyone. It's been a little while since we have done this environment, and I prefer to only kind of do it in special situations now. We got away from that every single two-week deal that uh, became a tradition in the aftermath of the uh, formerly known as COVID moment. But um, there's been a lot of market volatility the last few days. And as I saw futures this morning, I reached out to my uh, handy communications team, uh, Scott Gam and our studio managers and department directors, Brian and Glenn. And we said, hey, let's put something together today to get on video and audio for you guys about the specific moment we're in. And uh, for those of you who have watched me and Scott do this over the last couple of years, you know how we kind of like to riff around uh, the current moment. Obviously, we do have some questions and things that have come in that we'll address. But I'm going to let Scott drive, and I'll be here to answer questions about where we are in the midst of current market volatility. So with that, let me turn it over to our still uh, trusted uh, partner in crime, Scott Gam, who um, Scott's been a little while since we've been able to do this. So good to be back in front of you and let's uh, have our conversation, shall we? Yeah, David, let's do it. Great to be with you as always. And uh, certainly the past couple of days have been particularly volatile. Um, you talk about in, in some of your writings, uh, a repricing in markets, given the, the recent rise in, in interest rates. Um, what, what else should we know about that repricing? What, what are the, the kind of mechanics of it? Because we've been seeing a lot of volatility really since the start of the year. Yeah. It, so let's, let's talk about that first, because I'm sitting here looking at a chart of the Dow. The Dow is down close to 2,000 points from where it was a few days ago, as we're sitting here intraday right now, and that's a grand total of, you know, five or six percent. Um, the, the Dow had been at a pretty elevated level just as of a few days ago. I'd been rallying pretty hard. Um, and yet, when I talk about repricing, I really am talking about something much more than a two or three day event, and certainly more than these two or three days. Uh, because the NASDAQ's repricing, the technology sector repricing, you could argue the high yield bond market, you could argue cryptocurrency, you could argue um, consumer discretionary. There are plenty of things out there that are down more than five, six, seven, eight percent, down more than two, three, or four days, and it, it warrants the terminology repricing, a revaluation. Now, that is a um, term that needs a little definition. I'll give that to you. But it also is a term that can sound a bit more dour because a lot of times you have, we had, what was it last year, Scott? Five or six of those moments where the market had a four, five, or 6% drop that lasted three days. And generally it was around some kind of COVID spike or other some other nonsense. Um, but a repricing is being used as a word to suggest something more paradigmatic, meaning that there is a valuation adjustment being done to an asset class, being done to a sector, being done to a group. And therefore, it is not merely the volatility. Every day there's repricing, that's what volatility is, but a repricing that is more systemic where, hey, this has been trading in a range of 30 to 40 times earnings, and now it's going to trade in a range of 20 to 25 times earnings. I'm making up the numbers as an example. That's a repricing, a re-rating are, are some of the terms that we would use as uh, portfolio managers. So I've been convinced for some time that a repricing was coming across a lot of the frothier parts of the market. And I am now convinced that we are in that repricing, but I think it started before even the end of the year and has begun to kind of democratize a bit it started at some of the really absurdly priced things that were very low quality, some of the bad SPACs that came out and bad IPOs, and it expanded into some of the stuff that really had very little revenue, very little earnings, and was overdone and, and across different parts of software, technology. And then it went into the kind of COVID um, work from home, new technology, new economy stocks, that really proved to be none of the above. You know, they had a big spike. They certainly had an increase in customer awareness and brand awareness during the COVID moment. But some of the home video companies, some of the video technology companies, I'm not going to say names of real companies here, but I find it ironic 
that the one that became a household name during COVID is the one that you and I used for most of our recordings throughout the COVID moment. And we're actually not using it right now because my communications team that are paid professionals have found a better system for doing it, right? But no one was doing that before. And stock prices weren't reflecting real consumer um, discernment as much as kind of immediate uh, brand familiarity. And, and so that stuff has to catch through into stock prices. And you have a lot of these companies that were home exercise equipment and were do, uh, food delivery and whatnot, all with a technology bend and technology kind of um, ecosystem around them. Some of them are trading lower than they were before COVID. And that is a value destruction that is generously called a repricing because it's been a bloodbath. But we're not just looking, this is what I mean, the democratization of repricing. That group that was down 50 to 70% and even has names that are down 80 to 90%, that's sort of just a kind of punishment of speculators and a little bit of um, sanity that had to come back into the universe. Now, though, what I'm referring to repricing is you have the largest video streaming, entertainment streaming company in the world, um, the largest e-commerce dot-com type company in the world, down um, that company down 20%, the streaming company down over 50%, the largest social media company in the world down 50%. It's gotten into big tech now. It's gotten into big tech. And so the whole NASDAQ down near 20%. None of this is Ukraine, Russia. None of this is oil prices. No one canceled their favorite subscription, um, digital subscription service because of gas prices. I mean, maybe some did. I shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean. That's not the systemic factor going on here. You have a revaluation playing out in front of our very eyes. And so that is a byproduct of the excessive froth that was there that had to just kind of stop. And then the economic fundamentals of how a, an asset must be priced against a risk-free rate and a risk-free rate that is now on the 10-year, it went from 1.5% to you know 2.8%, 2.7%. You had the Fed funds rate that is about to get up to about um, 75 basis points that have been at zero. Uh, every yield point in the first two years of the curve is substantially higher from zero to two years. Your T-bills are now priced a bit higher. Still pretty low uh, historically, but as they play into the pricing of risk assets, they left long duration, high multiple equities, highly vulnerable, and uh, the chickens have come home to roost. Um, and, and, you know, perhaps part of this repricing, at least in, in recent weeks, has been driven by rising interest rates. Obviously, the 10-year Treasury yield is up quite a bit so far this year. Um, seems like the market's doing part of the Fed's job, although we know the Fed is likely going to gonna step up those interest rate hikes, uh, perhaps as soon as next week and, and for the rest of the year. But I also know that last year we, we would have occasional worries about higher interest rates or, or you know, the movements in the 10-year Treasury yield. And, and I know you've always also pointed out uh, that, that a higher 10-year yield is, is actually healthy. Um, it, it signals growth. And, and so, so what do you say to folks who, who are kind of you know, watching the, the, the tick by tick yield uh, on the 10 year and, and kind of trying to figure out what that means for, for the stock market's next move? Yeah, that's a great question. And I hope people forgive me for having to give a bit more sophisticated of an answer, but it really does warrant one. And I do my best to not offer complexity for complexity's sake. I prefer always to try to offer simplicity where that will effectively communicate the message. But this is not about absolute level of yields when you want to price in uh, growth. It's about spread. It's about the yield curve. It's about differentials between a particular point in the economic cycle, let's say six months out, and a particular point in the economic cycle, let's say 10 years out. So I would do anything to have a 3% 10 year. I'd like a 4% 10 year. If the six month level was at 1% and it was showing this nice steep curve that anticipated greater growth into the future. The interesting thing about what we're dealing with right now is not 
that the 10 years got up to 2.7. It's at the two years at 2.7, 2.5. It had been inverted a few weeks ago for a, a couple days or a couple seconds, you know. Right now, though, it's basically a flat line all the way from two years to 10 years. So I don't care if that number's at 3.5% or 2.5%. The yield curve is still pricing in no growth, Scott. It's all of the, the movement higher is in the next two years. So when you say the market's done the Fed's work for it, that's all that has happened is from zero to two years, they've priced in over 200 basis points of rate hikes, and then they anticipate total flatness terminally. They do not, the bond market is not pricing in inflation after two years, and it's not pricing in real economic growth after, after two years. And so I don't think I think you could have a, a two and a half percent tenure that was a good thing, and you could have a four and a half percent tenure that's a good thing. What you have to know to know how to interpret what the tenure is doing is what the shape of the yield curve looks like uh, before and after, and and then from there do a qualitative assessment as to why and and whether or not you're you're looking at bond markets trying to absorb inflationary concerns or growth expectations or whatnot. And so my view is that um, the, the market is basically saying the Fed's going to get the um, short-term rate up and they're pricing it in somewhere around um, 200 basis points within the next 18 months. And then they think the Fed's done. My personal view is that uh, the market has every reason to not believe that there's going to be that great economic growth beyond and great uh, reason to believe that there's going to be a premium on top of the Fed funds rate into the future. So the longer dated part of the curve is not pricing in inflation or growth expectations. Um, whether or not the market is overshot as to what the Fed will do remains to be seen. That's long been my view. I'm certainly more open to the idea that the Fed will prove more hawkish than I would have given them credit for. I think I've had a pretty good historical precedent for believing the Fed would be um, less hawkish than anticipated, but we do not know yet. People saying, well, look, the market's pricing in this and the Fed's talking this way. They still don't know what the Fed does when things really hit the fan. Right now, the Fed does not care what happens to overpriced technology companies. They don't care what happens to SPACs. Um, they're willing to let some heat come out of the financial markets. But it's when credit spreads fully dry up. Right now, the high yield spreads about 425 basis points wide over uh, treasuries. Um, if you start getting a total cessation of bank debt and of non-bank lending, um, you know, in kind of the juicier parts of credit markets, uh, it remains to be seen what the Fed might do. So far, I think the Fed's perfectly comfortable with what they're seeing in both stock and bond markets. But that could change. And yeah, it is my view that it will change. But I don't know at what level or when. Um, and, and so we'll have to see how that plays out. But that's the long answer to the question about the 10-year is that the market is essentially right now absorbing all of what it believes about the next 18 months that the Fed will you know, have to move the short term higher. And then after that, the market does not see that longer um, uh, growth expectation. What I would love is a, a better sloped yield curve that is more normal, that is pricing in more economic normalcy, a term structure that allows for a term premium, you know, a, a price of money, a price of time baked into the price of money. Why? Shouldn't someone lending their uh, government, lending the government money for 10 years get higher than lending it for two years? That's what you would expect in a normal world. The bond market's still not giving us that. So how would you characterize what we've seen in markets so far this year? I mean, would you, would you call it just a, a correction um, or um, is it just sort of the, the I guess, sort of con consecutive events coming together uh, sort of perfectly timed to, to give the market somewhat of a reason to, to stay low or, or to decline further. You know, it's really interesting. It's a few of these of these things all at once for different people and different investors. So I didn't ask you to ask that question, but in a way you're kind of teeing up an opportunity for me to point out 
you know, if, if one is a client of ours and is not looking at the market at all or the indexes, they're just looking at their own portfolio, they wouldn't know what you're talking about because it's not only that they haven't had a correction, they haven't even been down, right? I mean, I, I, energy stuff's getting hit a little bit today, but like for the most part, you know, a lot of value, energy, dividend oriented has had a very good year. Certain, you know, stocks and sectors within it may be down. But um, then if, if you looked at like people who were entirely only in really shiny object tech stuff, not even FANG and big cap, more profitable companies, but a lot of the junkiest junk, they may be getting walloped. It's not just a correction, it's an obliteration. And then you have varying differences in between. And for a lot of people who are index investors, um, it's been a, a slight correction. You know, the S&P's right around that kind of 10% level. NASDAQ a little worse and Dow a little better. And so it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a dispersion of result. And Scott, you know this because you've often been the one portraying, you're the, the messenger to the media sometimes when I'm portraying my viewpoint and you're telling the Wall Street Journal or Washington Post or or Yahoo Finance, you know, my, our beliefs on some of this stuff. I've been saying this for a while, that the similarities to the year 2000 are very interesting, that I, I was anticipating a risk-on, risk-off dispersion that didn't go where everything was risk-on and then everything was risk-off, which is mostly what we've been living in since the great financial crisis but rather something that was more NASDAQ and Dow-like from the year 2000. Where in that infamous year, obviously very early in my career, the NASDAQ got pummeled and the Dow was actually up. And it's so foreign to those of us in the, within the last 20 years of context because that has almost been an impossibility economically uh, in the last 20 years where everything just was so highly correlated to one another. The violence may have been worse in one area than another, and the upside may have been better in one area than another, but the directional correlations were, high, were very tight for most of the last 20 years. But back in 2000, when the NASDAQ fell off, value kind of went the other way, the Dow, various things that were not as connected. And that's sort of what I think we're in now. Um, it's, it's completely crazy to me that you have companies with over trillion dollar market caps or with well over $500 billion market caps that are the biggest household name companies in our world, huge software operating system companies and e-commerce.com companies that are down 20%. And yet the equal weighted S&P 500 is down six or 7%. Why is that? Well, it's because large cap value is really not down. The energy sector is really up quite a bit. So there's been some zigs and zags that have created a different experience to different people. I can't say that that will continue entirely. If this market sell-off accelerates enough, it'll catch up to other areas, but not in equal proportion. And there will be um, a far greater defensive merit to some of the higher quality companies and some of the more defensive sectors. It's one of the reasons, that even though they weren't really capturing a lot of offense earlier in the year, now consumer staples and healthcare are looking to be much more defensive. Um, and, and energy has been much more offensive all year. It's been beneficial. So this is a very interesting market and much more like year 2000 than the year you know, 2020 or 2008 or, or, or uh, some of the sell-offs we've had in between. Um, when you talk about the energy sector, David, I also know that uh, a, a segment within that sector that you've been talking about for, for quite some time, you know, really before the, the energy trade became so popular and perhaps crowded, was the, the midstream segment of the energy sector responsible for the transportation of energy. Uh, update us on, on your views there and kind of how you see that part of the, of the sector playing out over the next you know, year, or at least for the rest of this year. Yeah, I'm looking at right now, um, just as we're talking, and, and there's some downside in the, media, in the midstream energy sector today. So it's funny as we're talking that that is the case, but really it's just been an absolutely extraordinary place to be all year. And in a way that's different than some of the upstream companies that we've done very well in. 
because I am the first to say, and we've trimmed profits in some of our upstream exposure, that the upstream did not just do so well. It did so well where a lot of the value got taken out. It still has ongoing fair value, but it was no longer at a deep discount where I would argue there was like almost free money to capture and you were just simply waiting on the timing. That has gone away in upstream. Now, I still think there's a story there and I still want to be invested and we've trimmed profits but maintained our base weightings and our upstream exposure. But not only has midstream done well, it's never even got close to what I consider historical fair valuation. And we measure this by yield spreads. And so you look at what has the midstream sector done in its yield to investors relative to utilities over history, relative to corporate bonds over history, relative to the S&P, relative to various benchmarks. You gauge a historical valuation around the yield spreads and then look at all those spreads now and all of them tell the same story. If you get a divergent response, you have to wonder if something's broken. But essentially on a spread basis, the midstream area of energy still looks quite attractive for income, for growth and for growth of income. So uh, not only has it been a great performer, but we still believe in that story and, and candidly don't think it has anywhere near the same vulnerability around the price of the commodities. Um, there is definitely a truth that was exposed in the last seven years, a truth that was a learning experience for me as a portfolio manager, that there is a price at which um, commodities become relevant to midstream where they discourage the entire investor sentiment, where they discourage volumes to the point that even though you would think lower prices would create higher volumes, it, it speaks to lower production incentive. And therefore you're gonna have less oil and gas going through pipelines, okay? The difference is it's not um, on the margin sensitive from let's say $100 oil to $90 oil. There's sort of a gaping level, at like all of a sudden you're at $30 oil. Yeah, that just destroys midstream pricing. Fair enough. It destroys capital expenditure incentive for future projects and future growth. But right now, oil at 100 going to 80, that hurts profit margins for upstream, but it still leaves them perfectly profitable. But 100 to 80 doesn't even make a whiff of difference to midstream there would still be ample volume and ample profitability in the midstream where at 80 um, on the margin, it affects upstream. Now, I'm not saying we get back to 80. I was unaware 80 is even considered a low price. But my point is that um, I, I guess there are people that care if oil is 100, 107, 120, 95 for upstream. All I know is all those numbers are still very profitable. But for midstream... It doesn't matter at any of those numbers I just said. So the need for greater exporting of natural gas, the need for more infrastructure to facilitate such, the uh, profitability of these companies that are engaged in the storage and especially transportation of both crude oil and um, natural gas, the ability to convert natural gas, the, the processing and liquefaction processes, the export terminals that are needed. This entire story is highly compelling and that's engaged in the midstream component. And we'll, we'll, we could take a little bit of price volatility along the way, wouldn't concern us at all. Um, but it's been a great place to be this year and I think it's gonna continue to be, Scott. Yeah, and, and David, when we look at, uh, you know, certainly gains in the energy sector, this year gains in the midstream part of that sector this year declines in the broader markets this year how would you be thinking about new money that you might be putting to work and and would you be putting new money to work right now you know within various pockets of the market yes as a fiduciary our our clients um pay us to uh work their capital and not to merely um custody it and to the extent that we will manage the process of deployment of new capital around that specific client's risk tolerance, liquidity profile, given tactical considerations that we're engaging in as portfolio managers. Um, but the bias must always be towards the deployment of capital. 
Um, and right now we think that in our portfolio, there are things that ha have had a great run higher and there are things that look really, we love how, how they're priced right now uh, that have really kind of come down a bit. Some of the publicly traded private equity asset managers uh, it was one of the, the largest shopping mall REITs in the country. Um, there are a few things that we just love these prices and, and don't mind at all deploying heavily there. Um, and then there are other areas that are kind of in the middle. And so we're deploying with caution and prudence, um, putting a certain allocation of new cash to work to get that um, foot in the water. But then from a risk management or risk mitigation standpoint, then uh, tethering the rest of the money in either tactically or periodically. Uh, so there's nothing that is just so screaming cheap that we're saying, let's get all in. Uh, we're tethering, but we are most certainly not looking to be aggressively buried to the sideline. And, and I want to point out that one of the reasons is if you get a massive hawkish Fed surprise that does greater damage to markets, I'm stuck with two realities at once. One is the short-term impact to markets, which would clearly be um, damaging. And one is what I think would be a significantly greater um, long-term market environment. I am not worried about the Fed being more aggressive in normalization. I am excited for the Fed to, to um, prove me wrong. In other words, I would view that as a longer-term bullish signal. I, I, my hesitation is not that, wow, the Dow 33,000 could go to 30,000 if the Fed really surprises us with their balance sheet reduction or with their rate hikes. Uh, an extra 10% down for a long-term accumulator is a great thing, especially if it's going to now be in the context of a market that has removed some distortions, that has removed some impediments to long-term growth, that has perhaps removed some zombies that has allowed for a better risk pricing in the credit markets. Those things are uncomfortable for investors in the short term, but they'd all be better long term. And so I want our clients to hear me. I will take that because I think we will benefit from it longer term. Again, my problem is not thinking it will happen. It's being a bit skeptical that it because I'm not totally sure that it will. Um, but for next week's Fed meeting, uh, you think 50 basis yeah. points is... Sort of a done, deal. a done deal. They did a great job uh, pricing it in. They used forward guidance. They used press releases. They used press leaks. They used kind of the B team of the Fed governors who are in a lot of cases at first were not even voting members to get information out there. Markets kind of took it in stride. Then they just slowly continued this uh, kind of price it into markets drip by drip. And they didn't get anything that shock and awe them. And they're going to go forward to 50 basis points next week. Ultimately, it wasn't just what I was saying about press releases and leaks. They ended up with Chairman Powell himself telling us at the uh, IMF in a more recent speech, you know, that they're ready for the 50. So, um, you know, even when the head honcho is going out saying it, they've telegraphed already what they basically are supposed to be meeting about next week to discuss, it's clear they've already, already made their mind up. And, and just to go back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, assuming that happens next week, I wonder how the 10-year the yield or, or how the bond market responds to that because it, it's, it seems to have responded to that already. I, I, you are exactly right. It's already responded. And so there, it would be, uh, there would be nothing to respond to to announce that the... Um, that the Fed funds rate, which has a duration of 24 hours, is going up 50 basis points, there would be nothing for the 10-year to respond to. Um, and, and David, though, when you take a step back and, and maybe look at some more of the, the, the company-specific uh, fundamentals, you know, kind of taking a step back from, from monetary policy, uh, what has your reaction been to um, so, you know, the, the earnings calls, the, the earnings announcements we've seen so far, both for, for the companies that, that you own for clients at the Bonson Group, but also just kind of broadly. Um, is there anything that you're seeing that, that either worries you or that encourages you? Um, both. I've, we've had some great results in the market at large, and you've had some terrible results. And uh, within our own portfolio, we've had some just beautiful results that we were really happy with and a couple of disappointments. 
So one of the largest telecom companies in the world uh, disappointed us uh, late last week. Um, and not with any real operating results per se, but the disappointment was more in their guidance um, around the their pricing power um, was less than we would have expected. And then the portion of the debt on their balance sheet that is fixed and therefore unaffected by rate movement, um, there, there were, you know, they came out to announce that 75 to 80 percent of the debt was fixed and wouldn't impact things. But the market immediately said, well, that means 20 to 25 is not. And this is going to take away 150, 200 million dollars of EBITDA for you, or excuse me, of, of earnings, um, not not EBITDA, which which does not factor in interest expense. And and so, th you know, that was a negative story. But then we look at one of our old tech companies that released last week, and it was just a glorious quarter, record revenue growth, and a lot of great things happening strategically. So we've had divergent results in our own portfolio, and the market itself has seen it. So both as it pertains to our own portfolio holdings and the market at large, it's very early. You're only about 20% of the way through earnings season. So by the end of this week, we'll be closer to 50%. By the end of the week after, we'll be closer to 80%. So the next two weeks are, are pretty heavy on earnings results, uh, both in our companies and in the market at large. And you talk about that old tech theme, um, which you know clearly is is playing out this year, just compared to I guess w what many would call new tech being Fang, which has had a, an obviously a, a very tough go around over the past you know several months. But for some of those stocks, the past several years. Yeah, it's funny. I've always thought of Fang as new tech and cool tech. It's certainly big tech. The big tech part hasn't changed, but the new tech and cool tech has definitely changed. It's 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 you know newer than my old tech, but it's older than like the real shiny object tech, the innovation tech, the arc tech, if you will. You know what I mean there. And um, so even within Fang, you you have some companies that are down over fifty percent, and some uh, one company that's only down eight or nine percent. And it's done much better. And so um, I, I think that there is an indexing reality to FANG because of market cap weighted indexes. There's a certain component of ongoing buying that, put, that has helped. Other, uh, other names have been fundamentally impaired. Um, yeah, you know, so all the different things happening on the technology side are, as we talked about well over a year ago, definitely facing a dispersion of result now. We'll see that in earnings season as well. Uh, we saw last in Q1 announcing for Q4, you had Fang names that had huge upside in their stock price after they released, and you had Fang names that got killed. And and I expect the same thing will happen this quarter too. Disper dispersion of results. Yeah, and, and I mean, but in terms of you know some of the other themes that have been coming up on these earnings calls, inflation, yeah. um, or just sort of broader labor shortages or, or things like that. Uh, and I know obviously in last week's Dividend Cafe was, uh, you, you were focused on the, the labor shortage and the, the so-called great resignation, but um, maybe connect those thoughts with what we're hearing or not hearing from companies that you follow. Yeah, I, I think that um, you hear the word inflation in uh, company uh, earnings results now way more than you ever have. Um, but by the way, you said uh, the inflation pressures and then labor shortages. And I would actually argue that the, the labor shortage is very heavily correlated to the inflation pressures. And I'm quite convinced from a macroeconomic standpoint that it's the biggest driver uh, of inflationary pressures is the labor shortages. And so you look to what might be happening in Shanghai right now and in Beijing and where you get a shortage of laborers at that level of the supply chain and multinational companies that have China playing a very big role in either the front end or the middle component of some supply chain process and where that slows things down and puts price, upward price pressures, the markets do not like that. And that's a huge part of what would be going on right now. And so it's not inflation in the way we're used to discussing it about the Fed or about government spending. Um, and yet I think that's a very big component. Obviously, the story of last year where there and this great resignation, the stuff I wrote about in Dividend Cafe Friday, 
That has added a lot to labor shortages um, that have then created a lot of goods inflation, meaning uh, upward pricing pressures in, in goods versus services. Now you're seeing it more in services, and I think you're going to see it less in goods later in the year. So those extrinsic circumstances, whether it's shutdowns in China that are impacting supply chain or great resignation dynamics um, in the United States, all those things are very relevant in the economy as we sort things through. And so it forces you to have to listen to analyst calls during earnings season because it affects every company differently. Yeah, well said. Uh, and, and David, uh, I think that's a, a good place to leave our conversation for today. We covered a lot on a, during an important time for the markets with, you know, volatility continuing to, uh, you know, show its face. So uh, grateful for your insights. Always great to be back with you, David. And uh, I know we'll talk soon. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott. Appreciate you jumping on on short notice and obviously all the, the great work you, you do for us at Bonson Group. And, and I want to just cl close everybody with, this comment, first of all, I hope you got a lot of the call because we did discuss a lot of macro subjects and I thought Scott's questions probed the right spots for where we are. But um, hopefully my my compliance and supervision folks are thrilled with us because we got into a lot of micro as well and we did not say the name of a single company. So we, we played um, it within the sandbox and yet hopefully you get an idea of some of the real micro components taking place in the market right now that were useful for you on this call. So I'm going back to my desk. I'm, I'm uh, getting back on with the traders here, see what we're going to do the last couple hours. Now, Scott, I looked at the market in the middle of our call. I think you did it again. You brought the market into positive territory. Um, and that was something we used to do quite a bit back in our, uh, you know, kind of different iterations of COVID calls. We would get on the phone or get in the video. Markets are down 500 points. By the time we're done talking, markets might have been up 100 or 200 and uh, uh, we just sort of did it again. And so if this keeps up, clients are going to ask us to get start doing these calls more often. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's not me. It's you. I, I just ask the questions. I don't give any of the uh, any of the wisdom. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, it's not. It's <laughs> not you're things. right, though. It's not you, but it's also not me. Uh, these are markets, right? This is what markets do. And uh, they could be down 500 by the final hour of trading today. They could be up 500 and tomorrow's a new day. Expect higher volatility, friends. Um, it's a big theme. Scott and I alluded to it. Uh, if you want to know why, this is what has been put into, this is in the recipe for what has been put into the great stew of financial markets. For years and years, we've been adding ingredients that have basically forced a time of exacerbated volatility. You cannot have that much financial repression with that level of monetary intervention and not end up best case with higher volatility and worst case with significant repricing. This is the world you're in. It's not going away. We'll continue to do what we do managing through it. And uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, interven intervening call. Thank you as always to the great folks in our strategy and communications department, the Bonson Group. And Scott, thank you once again. And uh, we'll look forward to rejoining at another time. Take care.